Yeah. All right, so hi, I'm Russ, I'm Russ Grimes, I'm a professor in computer science and also adjunct in psychiatry. I'm going to talk about toward patient specific treatment, medical applications of machine learning. Um, oh, yeah, this is really exciting times. Almost every day, there's another exciting article about machine learning, not all of which are chat GTP, but there are things like the, the chest X, chest X, a diagnosis of pneumonia, better than human radiologist using deep learning. Or a tool, the uh, Artemis tool that diagnoses heart problems has been cleared by the FDA. Our, our colleagues at DeepMind had a tool called API, the acute kidney injury, that can find how hard to detect kidney problems, again, by, deep, by DeepMind people in England a few years ago. <coughs> One of my doctors was a dentist. He said, tell me what's happening in dentistry. So quick search, got a pearl, the second opinion, an FDA approved tool to help real-time pathology detection of tooth decay as well as calculus and root, root abscesses. It's been cleared, it's actually deployed right now. <coughs> We're in Edmonton. Uh, this wonderful tool that looks at a urine test to detect, detect adenoma, precancer colon. And again, I don't know, you guys probably aren't over 50, so you probably don't know what this is, to your credit. This is a fecal occult blood test, which is a way to can unknowingly, uh, way to determine whether you have things that might look like, as a screening test, decide if you should get scoped later on. Oh, it's pretty icky, it's not that accurate. <coughs> we designed here at Edmonton, MTI, the top of this technology corporate, has a tool that's a urine test. It might be easier to use, much more, and actually more effective as a pre-colon test, pre-colon cancer test, sorry. <clears throat> so that's in the world, public, the public world. If you look at PubMed, and look at the number of articles with the mesh terms machine learning, you can see literally exponential growth in the number of papers that have appeared that involve machine learning. <clears throat> um, I guess if you're curious, any, any guesses, this article is a month old, but any guesses on how many results are now in PubMed on machine learning? 10, 100,000, 10,000, 100,000? 10,000? Uh, well, by a factor of 13. <coughs> and again, exponential growth is probably 150 by now. Lots and lots and lots of articles have appeared that show the world is interested. The machine learning, so the medical community uh, sort of knew of it way back when, but boy, it really took. <coughs> and again, that's the world in at large. <coughs> Here in Edmonton, which is there, uh, I've been involved for the last 20 years in medical applications. I started with cancers, adenoma, like that type of thing, brain tumors, prostate cancer. I uh, went <coughs> to work with, um, with transplantation, you know, with Bill Hunter and other people, as well as, <coughs> as, well as um, um, and it's a kidney work, and Bill Hunter and liver. Um, and then the diabetes diagnosis, and a few years ago I was on sabbatical and I didn't say no. You know, a whole bunch of other cold calls I responded to about a whole wide variety of different tasks, all of which were interesting things, many publications, or, or to at least initial boards in this topic, and grants, and so forth. Lots of exciting things going on. <clears throat> that was the motivation. It's an exciting area, exciting times. I'm going to give some examples. I'm going to talk about an example to illustrate some illustrate some ideas, learn to predict breast cancer relapse, and use that to understand the distinction between typical bias statistics, which looks at correlation, versus machine learning, which looks at prediction tasks. So first part, I'll then give a machine learning one-on-one -on -one with a few simple algorithms, just good motivations to understand what's going on. And then uh, <coughs> talk about evaluation, which is a critical point. And then I have some accordion slides. Uh, if, if Kim is saying, oh, come on, let's finish up, I'll skip a bunch of examples. If I still play time, I can talk about five or six other tasks I've been involved with that show how machine learning can be applied in very, very different areas. And then a few other topics to round up. So here, I'm going to talk about predicting breast cancer relapse. So <coughs> this is all the biology I know about junctional cells. The way people described it, this is a John Mackey and Manager of Pazdar telling about cell adhesion, uh, that, that there's on the, on the surface of cells, on the cell membrane, there's some protein that stick through the walls 
and they hold other they hold other cells together, and that leads to tissues being formed. And this is a canhedrin catenin complexes that they hold the cell and tissues, and that's what they're supposed to do. But it turns out <coughs> when they're disrupted, two things happen. When they go rogue, first they're not doing their job as being part of a zipper, and second they seem to move the cytoplasm and nucleus. And they interact with growth regulatory proteins. And they think it might trigger metastasis and maybe lead to relapse. So that's my understanding of the biology. Um, you probably know more, much more about it than I ever will, but that's the idea of these canhedrin canhedrin complexes and what they do. Why is this relevant? <coughs> they said, well, gee, imagine you had a tool that could target the location of these junctional proteins, these six or seven different proteins that should be on the cell membrane, but actually are in the wrong place. Prior to treatment, can I predict which patients have early relapse based on that? So that was a question they raised. And the way I look at this question, <coughs> this is my world. Uh, they said, OK, Russ, <coughs> got 66 patients. For every one of these patients, these are breast, women with breast cancer. We now have <coughs> 30 patients. We know them. Um, what's the, the membrane, the cytoplasm, the nucleus, the concentration of, of alpha catenin in these locations, beta catenin, E coherence, so a bunch of different proteins. We also, by the way, know other things. We know, <coughs> you know six different proteins in three locations. We also know other things about woman's age, the size of the tumor, uh, other celebrity proteins like, P, like P10, you know its concentration in the cell at large. We also know the outcome. This is historical woman. We know who had a relapse in three years and who did not. So there's my world. All right, now what? What do you do with this matrix? <coughs> One important question is association studies by correlation. All right, what gene I should knock out next, the next experiment? So the way to do this is <coughs> it could be the correlation I meet these 30 features with the outcome over here, and they say to you, which ones of these numbers are really high, are positive or negative? And so I look at key values or whatever. I say, based on that, based on, on the correlation of each feature with the outcome, that suggests the features that are highly correlated. And that gives me an understanding of the disease, perhaps the ideology, and that suggests perhaps what to knock out with you guys. <coughs> Great work. That's what they do. <coughs> by the biostatistics, find these, these covariant uh, correlations. But a different question is to predict the outcome for a novel individual. So here, instead of this question, what genes did I have? The question now is, here's a novel patient who says, well, I have a relapse, and get an accurate answer, which we hope is negative, but at least want to know the correct answer. So that's a different question. How do we do that? Well, <coughs> I mentioned 30 features. Let's look at, for example, the number of lymph nodes. And this is a graph. How many women had two and one and zero? Um, and unknown and for both people with recurrence, without a recurrence. And we can try to figure out from this, you know, which you know, have a rule that says, for example, any any tumor, any um, <coughs> any lymph nodes infections say yes, I'm going to say no. That'd be a rule you can propose. But that was one feature. There's 30 features. <coughs> Beta catenin in the nucleus. We can build a model from that <coughs> and try to figure out what's going on with that. Or maybe the tumor size, try to have, see how that's correlated. Again, red, me, red means cor recurrence, blue means no recurrence. We can find patterns in that. I want to point out, I'll come back later on, <coughs> for a bit of the nucleus, the correlation, that number is zero, right? Negative zero point zero one nine. I'm going to come back to that if you remember that. <coughs> I can keep going. I can talk about age of diagnosis or P10. And they have correlations, and I can use those as classifiers, perhaps. But why one feature? I got 30. I can find combinations that might be helpful. So <coughs> back to this caricature again, the biostatisticians will point out yes, they do look at predictor models, and they also don't just look at univariate. But that's not the focus. Machine learning looks at predictor models based on many features, based on multivariate analysis. So what would that mean? It would mean, let's take the, let's take the women and the women 
describe rich terms of all 30 features. But then a class bar is a tool that, given this description, comes back with answers, yes or no. You know, <coughs> it'd be wonderful if medical science had reached a stage where we understand that alpha catenin interacts with P10 and how it relates with postmenopausal women with this or that. You know, it'd be great if we were there. We're not there yet. We don't really know all the underlying mechanisms. So how can it be possible to classify the does this? How can we figure out what combination works? Well, the answer is, you remember that data set I mentioned? <coughs> Machine learning provides tools that take this type of tableau, this type of matrix, give that as input, produce a classifier, which then can give us answers. So that's what machine learning is all about. <coughs> How is that possible? How can these features collectively define the classifier? What are the patterns? <coughs> so it can be complicated. Let me start very easy. Imagine this was your data. Imagine I had <coughs> number of lymph nodes and ages made up example. <coughs> Negative means no relapse, positive means positive, means there was a relapse. So imagine this is the data we saw. <coughs> and I had this picture over here. And now a sip of water. And so I ask, uh, what do you think? Is this a positive or a negative piece? Actually, positive? <coughs> So that's positive. And why? Well, look, everyone close to him is positive, everyone close to her is positive. It looks pretty obvious. Just by, by looking, you can visualize and say, yes, there's an obvious boundary over here, and then that's positive. <coughs> and yes, I think everyone would agree that that's what you would say. It's educated guess. <coughs> it's not based on post-mortem or definitive tests, it's just the data we have right now. But you might be strong enough that you would make a decision, a human decision, basically. Well, that was a very easy case. If the whole world's that easy, I wouldn't have a job. <coughs> Consider this case. Right? Imagine it's still just two, two, two different features. And you can tell a story about why it's positive because you know, it's a pattern that way or negative that way. You can tell both stories. It's not obvious what should happen here. But that's just two dimensions. <coughs> what if you had three dimensions? You kind of visualize this, you squint and you wear these, these uh, um, 3D glasses and 3 work clothes on it. It's not so easy. That's three dimensions. The data I showed you a moment ago is 30 dimensional. Can you visualize that? You can't. <coughs> we're talking about examples which are 50 dimensional or 100 dimensional or 7 million dimensional. But maybe the same ideas that work for this low dimensional space you can apply it in more general. So, <coughs> so that was the example. Let's go through machine learning. I get some very simple algorithms. I to give some motivation and talk about evaluation. <coughs> so one class of algorithms are linear separators. Linear line separators. So the data looks like this. Uh, you say what you uh, <coughs> I can see a line here. Uh, axis parallel. We'll look at if there's more than 1.5 lint nodes, so yes, always say no. <coughs> and that's a pretty obvious linear separator. <coughs> And so this one would be a relapse because it's greater than 1.5 in that image. <coughs> now what about angle lines? And again, uh, there might be some math, any, any, any math folks here? Good. <coughs> so do you remember from, from high school math classes, the formula for a straight line is a linear combination. So this line might be you know, number of lymph nodes times negative 2.3 plus the number, I'm sorry, no lymph times 7.5 plus h times negative 2.3. You get a line like this. And this is the line of uh, that plus that plus the constant is equal to zero. And now, if for a given individual, if their age diagnosis and number of lymph nodes is greater than zero, I say yes, I'll go to sleep. <coughs> okay, we don't worry about the math. So that'd be the simple, simple rule to make a decision. <coughs> Now, the same idea applies for many features, so not just two dimensions. I could have this characteristic over here and these are features. And now I want to find weights with the property that if I the linear combination of the features, if that's bigger than zero, I say yes, but let's say that. And so if this is true, if it's greater than zero, I say yes. In other ways, I say no. So, <coughs> so give a little, a little picture here. Um, imagine I have I imagine I've learned the weights in certain features, and now for a given individual, this describes the new patient. 
I just look at 1 times 2.3 plus 35 times negative 7.5, dot, 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 plus negative 3 times 21, and that number clearly is 48.6. Is that bigger than zero? So I say yes. So once I have the Lorentz model, it's really easy. I just do multiplications and additions, and there's my answer. It's a dot point, if you will. <coughs> now, at earlier, before I could do this, I had to have I had to learn this. How do I learn it? Well, <coughs> these are my things labeled data I had earlier, and produces the weights. So that's a challenge. Given a given a major tension earlier, how do I find the weights which are best? <coughs> So there's lots of tools for doing it. One is called the support vector machine, which tries to find the weights and height of the weights and the line that goes through these points. And given this picture here, <coughs> you can imagine this is a linear subgrade. This is subgrade. It's in red this side, blue that side. So is this, so is this, so is all these qualified. <coughs> all right, actually, which one of these is best? Who would vote for Mr. Purple? Um, I guess Ms. Ms. Teal, is that green? <coughs> Why? Well, let's look at it. It's, it's, it's robust, right? <coughs> if this guy was a little bit over there, purple would get him wrong. And same with this guy here, you know. Green is in the middle. It's far from everything. It's nice and um, far from the boundaries. <coughs> okay, let's see over here. <coughs> And so a support vector machine has this cool idea. I'll define the margin of a line as the distance to the nearest point. So for this line, that distance, and that distance I'll say, it's right in the middle. This, this is the line, that distance is a margin. I want to find the line with the property that the margin is as large as possible. So the, the line with the property that the nearest point is as far as possible. <coughs> And that's one. And I want to find out it maximizes that. And it turns out <coughs> there's fast ways of doing it. If I give you a data set that's linearly separable, we'll find the edge, the line, the hyperplane, which is as robust as possible. So we're done. The data is linearly separable, it's a fast argument that finds the best one. <coughs> and so we're done. We've got the answer to all the world's problems. Except I lied. <coughs> now, this thing is true. So here's an example of two-dimensional space, just four points. Is this linearly circle? Is there a line which is plus on one side and minus the other one? So this line doesn't qualify. It is plus, and here two are negative, but one's positive, so that doesn't count. Okay, <coughs> but that's just one line. <coughs> maybe if I spin around, maybe, nah, yeah. every every position. Well, okay, well, let's try other Maybe if I move it over. <coughs> there. So now everything is positive. Oh, now that's not showing this side. <coughs> so this is, a, again, so this is an example where this data is not linearly simple. There is no line which is plus on the side or minus on the side. <sighs> Some data sets are not linearly simple. So this news is still true. This pass out and find the best possible line for linearly simple spaces. But most situations are not linear separable. So <coughs> there are extensions to linear separability. There's this things like kernel functions and things. But there's other tools. In my arsenal, my, my quiver has other arrows in it besides linear models. <coughs> Decision trees. So there's like five different fields that have rediscovered this simple idea. Decision tree. <coughs> Let me go through an example. <coughs> This is quite intuitively see there's no line that would fit it perfectly. <coughs> but maybe I can magic say, let's split on this axis. Let's split this way. <coughs> the side split on that point, that way. <coughs> and now I got two subproblems. Smaller symbol. And now let's try to keep splitting. Maybe there's a split here in that group separate. Yeah. <coughs> How about that split? <coughs> Good, we've done with that one, done with that one. Oh, we're not quite done. But you can imagine one more split we got. So that's the idea. I'm going to split it by axis by lines, you know, by horizontal, vertical lines. And eventually I get to a pure state. <coughs> Once I have that, uh, you can imagine this recursive partitioning and say, well, <coughs> here's the model. 
First ask, is the temperature bigger than 35? If, if it's not, then ask, is the blood pressure greater than 80? If the answer is yes, say negative. If the answer is no, say positive. And it goes this side, so you can see what's going on. So this is a decision tree algorithm. This is a decision tree that was learned from the data. <coughs> There's lots of tricks here. Um, this how do I decide what to split on? When do I stop? Do I accept a little bit of error to avoid overfitting? How to come with real versus discrete values and so on. <coughs> There's have a website you can go to to just learn about decision trees. Okay. <coughs> so, you guys remember from 10 minutes ago I talked about, what was it, a <coughs> relapse from breast cancer? So we actually tried it. <coughs> tried it. We gave our algorithm, this decision tree algorithm, said, here you go, here's your data, tell me a rule, tell me a decision. I go, but this guy. <coughs> the algorithm says, look, <coughs> it's alpha cadmium, um, in the nucleus, remember it's not supposed to be a nucleus. If it's in the nucleus, say relapse. Not in the nucleus, okay, so we're not done yet. Ask about number of lymph nodes. If there's a lymph nodes, say relapse. I'm sorry, I'm over here. <coughs> if there are no lymph nodes, then ask about P10. And now look at this mess. If there's no, lots of P10, say no relapse. If there's none, very little P10, say no, say relapse. Otherwise, ask about beta cadmium and make a decision based on its concentration in the nucleus. <coughs> oh, sorry, I shouldn't do this, but <coughs> got the image. <coughs> Let me point out, remember I mentioned beta cadmium nucleus, and I said this is a worthless feature, it's correlation to the wizard, but there it is in my decision tree. So that's, that's why, if you're just looking for features which by themselves are important, you might not find it. Okay. <coughs> um, so I talked about a few arguments, the linear separators, the support vector machines, <coughs> the decision trees, <coughs> this kernel trick, this way to go decision tree, I'm sorry, linear separators which are linear in another space. There's, you heard about neural nets and deep nets. Yeah, that's another extension to linear separators. We have multiple labels of those. There's Bayesian classifiers, there's K nearest neighbor. <coughs> so we should look at mixtures, combinations of different classifiers, put them together. Uh, <coughs> bagging, groups, and stacking. You can talk about not just true or false, but you know, multiple values or real value regression problems. Yada, yada, yada. So lots of different tricks. If you're interested in this, <coughs> the classes I teach on top. They're just across 87th Avenue. And I'll talk about how you can do machine learning and worry about that one. <coughs> and that part of it. So I'm going paste it. <coughs> Let me go to the next, next chapter, which is uh, evaluation. Any questions at this point? Okay. <coughs> evaluation. <coughs> so what is the goal of this? So here's my data. So, um, my intuition, <coughs> I want to do well on the, on the training data. There's my training data, do well on this set of data. Well, that's kind of a worthless goal. I know the answer. I know A is no and B is yes and B is no. I have to learn anything I got right there. That's not the goal. The goal really is to do well on unseen data. Data that that isn't one of the things I've seen before, but to generalize beyond that. So do well in this example, <coughs> which didn't match any of those. That's the goal. Um, how is that possible? <coughs> um, the goal is to classify it as well in data I haven't seen. So again, this is a novel patient here. And novel means it did not appear in the set. That's a different individual. Because again, this one appears. <coughs> so if learning is doing well in data I haven't seen, is it just guessing? Is it magic? Uh, don't think so. Let me talk about why it should work. <coughs> Here's my little story. He goes to a medical clinic, I set up in Edmonton, and over a few years I assembled <coughs> 200 data points, <coughs> 200 patients, and I, I call it D, and then I read the learning of this data set and produced a classifier. And the classifier that I learned, this C, which is a function of little L of D, I want to do well, maybe not perfect, but well on D. I do a good job. <coughs> and now I have another patient, same distribution. So these are Evertonian women who I think they might have breast cancer uh, before the year 2022. And here's one in 2022. So a different individual. But from the same, same population, same dem dem demographics and so forth. 
So <coughs> why should a class which is well in that do well here? And here's the argument. Two cases. One case is this is a very common type of picture. Imagine this is a to be concrete. Imagine <coughs> this two hundred subjects, and this type of patient occurs one time in ten. It's a very common type of breast cancer. Um, and it's one time in ten. That means the data set size two hundred. I've probably seen twenty women, twenty patients who look like this one. And remember, <coughs> the class where it has to do well on the data it's seen. So if I did poorly, if it did poorly on something that occurred one time in ten, that's a ten percent hit right there. So it wouldn't do well if it if it does poorly on 10% of the data. So, <coughs> so chances are, for common cases, it's prob it probably gets those right. So I would expect it does well enough. So that's common cases. That's what you want. But, <coughs> but you say, but wait a second. Not everyone's common. What about exceptional cases? <coughs> what about a case that occurs one time in 10,000? Well, a one in 10,000 case how many of those am I going to see in a data set of size 200? No. No. I'm not saying, you know, <coughs> I haven't seen. It still might do well, but there's no evidence. So let me point out, this isn't a problem with machine learning. What do you, you know, medicine is apprenticeship, right? There's an appointment of a medical resident, a medical <coughs> trainer just follows a clinician around and does and sees what that person sees. And again, that clinician might see 200 patients when you're watching. That, that person, but you won't see the rare cases either. And this is a state of about statistics, right? Rare cases are rare, and you might not see them. That's the bad news. The good news is <coughs> they're not common. You will make mistakes, but they're small penalties. Again, I'd rather not make any mistakes, but if, if the divine, uh, divine intervention came in and says, you can make mistakes on any kind of patients you want, would you rather, would you rather make mistakes on an uncommon case or a common case? Clearly, you want to, more people can save by getting the say that backwards, by getting the correct answer on common cases. So again, I'm not trying to make any mistakes ever, but that's the way statistics work. That's the machine learning works. I do want a data set, I probably do well in the same distribution. Questions? <coughs> so how do you evaluate a classifier with that context? So one intuition is I train a data set, I then test the same data set. Well, <coughs> that causes problems, right? right. Um, I'd be very optimistic. I'd let me give an example of this. Um, did Kim tell you it's going to be a finalist in the class? You told me, right? <coughs> so, um, now imagine, imagine I actually have his file. I said, here you go, why don't you study this? I handed, I handed you the same file and the answers. I said, there you go, <coughs> study it, look at it, understand it, hand it back to me. <coughs> And then along comes Sunday, and there's the same file. Then you gotta get a score. Is that scoring reflect how well you know the material? No. <coughs> we see the answers. <coughs> just memorize it. There's no generalization, there's no learning per se, it's just memorization. So by contrast, <coughs> let's imagine <coughs> training non-natural test data, but on relevant non-test data. So again, suppose I gave the final I gave seven years ago. 17. It's similar, you know, machine learning hasn't changed that much, but it's not quite the same. So you study, you hand it back, <coughs> and you learn from that data, and now I'm giving you the 2024 file, <coughs> you have that data to work at. And now, is this going to reflect your knowledge? Much better, because you've actually seen not the same data, but similar data. That's the idea. You don't want to be evaluating the same data you're trained on, because that's too easy. It's not reflecting how well you're going to do. In the real world, we got new instances from the So that suggests you may want to train on some part of data and test on this joint set. <coughs> so here's a framework. I've got a label data set. I run a learn and I produce a decision tree. Okay, now, someone says, okay, that's great. <coughs> I'm happy for you. How good is that decision tree? Tell me if I should buy it or not, if I should use it. Would you trust your mother to uh, be using this to diagnose her condition? <coughs> so I want a certificate saying how good it is. How do I get that certificate? Well, <coughs> one approach is I could take, I could divide the data into 80% and 20%. Take the 
And with the same learn on that, I go, I propped a different decision tree. And now I want to know how good this decision tree. The one that's, that's probably similar to this, because it's based on the same type of data, just a small sample. How good is this tree? Well, I wish I had a data set in the same distribution that was a different data set. Count. So I can evaluate a data set in the same distribution, but disjoint. So I got a pretty accurate estimate of how good this guy is. And this guy's a pretty good, this guy's quality is pretty similar to that guy's quality because the same learner on the same type of data, just a smaller sample. So <coughs> I can probably believe that this error is a pretty good measure, a pretty good measure of the tr this guy's true error if I had a real humble out set. Well, that's one thing, but why do I stop there? Why do I try, well, I hold this one out, that one out, so I hold up all five of them. And every time through, I run, <coughs> I build a learner from four bits of data and evaluate on a disjoint fifth, fifth of data. <coughs> Take the average of those, and that's a pretty good estimator of how good that kind of code. This is called cross validation. This is five fold cross validation. You can imagine what ten fold cross validation is. Or leave one out, that is, I've got a thousand examples. I take 999 and hold one out, so I do this a thousand times. It gets expensive computationally, but that's a basic algorithm. <coughs> Let me just point out a few more things about, I mentioned don't test the training example. So here I did something silly. I looked at these, these um, learning algorithms, classifiers are based on a single feature each time, there's 30 features. And I looked at the resubstitution error is if I test on the training data. Like it, if some do really, really well, some do not so good, but, but this is the score I get if I if I test it, I test on the data I trained it on. But now, <coughs> if I use cross-validation, I get another way to get true accuracy. And I see it's always a bit worse. Well, it's a bit the same. There's often a pretty sizable gap between what I, what resubstitution I claimed to get and what I really would get. Make sense? So it does make a difference. <coughs> this is a more meaningful estimate of how it would work on a non work basis. So, um, that decision tree, and again, I'll skip the details, <coughs> to a whole bunch of classifiers, and we found that um, on the receptive share, support vector machines gets perfect, but who cares? That was cheating. Uh, which one came out best actually was the decision tree I showed you. That was about 80% accurate on data it had seen. <coughs> that paper was published, um, wow, 15 years ago? Getting old. <coughs> so that was one example. Uh, there's a lot of examples of machine learning applied to many other application areas. This is subset location of proteins, but <coughs> I do the cancer. But I've also worked in many applications. This is breast cancer using clinical features in histology or prognosis for an exit patient. But <coughs> I've also looked at other cancers, brain tumors, colon cancer, prostate cancer, and so forth. And again, I'm going to add like psychiatry, a whole bunch of, of different diseases in that context. Strokes, cardiovascular problems, diabetes management. Uh, I'll talk about COVID later on, transplantation, and so forth. And using features where I talked about <coughs> clinical histology, but a lot of work of electronic health records, omics, you know, gene uh, SNPs, our day wish it, so on, all omic analysis, imaging data, say a bit about that in a moment, speech, population data, and not just prognosis, but also screening, diagnosis as well as treatment management. These get the papers that appear in the medical literature. I'm a machine learning guy. My standard I look at is papers that expand the machine learning. I've got a bunch of results on high dimensional data, combined data sets, and, uh, survival predictions, and so on. My interest these days of foundational level. We all often tie in with these challenges. <coughs> so remember I mentioned accordion slides? I'm at that point right now. Uh, I can talk about <coughs> Cachexia, breast cancer, microarray SNPs, brain tumors, all of them, any of them? I'll just keep playing. At some point you start going a little faster. Cachexia. Okay, metabolomics, okay, small molecules. Do you know what metabolome is? <coughs> um, so I'm part of the human metabolism project where we're trying to find small molecules that appear in the body uh, that are exogenous or endogenous. Uh, 
and just trying to understand how to use this for diagnosis and so forth. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> Cachexia, so many cancer patients have muscle wasting, and so they, we predict who's going to have that. So <coughs> it's, a game. it's a different woman, by the way. Uh, get a urine sample, get an NMR spectrum of that. There's a whole interesting challenge of going from the spectrum spectrum to the tel um, tel pro metabolic profile, which is a concentration of various small molecules. <coughs> but then the machine learning part is, how do I classify? How do I determine for this individual, does the person have a cachexia or not? And yes or no answer. How do you do this? Well, <coughs> 74 patients, 54 features. We have the labels. We both have told for this. About 82 percent that appeared uh, 14 years ago. Um, Colin Kent already hinted at this result. Colonoscopy is a definitive test for adenoma. That's expensive, time seeming uncomfortable. Um, there's this test, the fecal occult blood test. Again, I talked about it earlier, it's icky, you don't want to do it, but if you have to, you do. <coughs> There'll be a test which you pee in a cup and you look at that, and here's the AC curve, and it turns out it just dominates it. Um, this urine based test <coughs> that appeared uh, uh, 11 years ago. <coughs> And again, this, this, this. It, it's not available yet in Edmonton. It's some kind of here, but I think New York is trying it out. So. <coughs> I showed this picture earlier. You know, that, it says Edmonton growing something out of that. <coughs> Breast cancer microarray. Okay, so looking at DNA expression levels. Uh, <coughs> there's this weird phenomenon that I'm not a pathologist or, or a medical doctor, but I assume Kim can confirm that if you take a cell, you can probably look at the cell and, and probably figure out if it's a skin cell or an eye cell, a lung cell, a heart cell. <coughs> it's, very it's very different. But the weird thing is, all these diff different things, these different types of cells, there's one blueprint, there's one description of them, and that's the DNA. <coughs> how can one blueprint do it? How can one blueprint <coughs> produce a bottle and a, and a, and a memory and a, and a presenter, mouse, and, and also this, this chair, well, the answer is clear, right? <coughs> different parts of DNA are involved. It's different. different parts are expressed and read for different parts. And so a microarray is a tool which looks at the part of DNA are being read, which ones are in the messenger RNA framework. And I can distinguish these different organs. Tumors also often correspond to expressions of different parts of DNA. When you look at the microarray, determine which tumors, did, did both these are tumors and also types of tumors. So that was a challenge. <coughs> Another realization. Uh, you guys know John Mackey? <coughs> World class breast cancer specialist who actually has left, unfortunately, but did a lot of cool work. Part of the breast cancer is really main diseases. There are all uncontrolled growth of cells in the breast, but there are different ideologies, different treatments, and so forth. <coughs> Which treatment's best depends on things like the hormone receptor status. And I mentioned that if it's ER positive, tamoxifen works really well. If it's HER2 positive, then trituzumab works well. So it's nice to know whether these things are being expressed. And there were stories <coughs> a few years ago where there was a whole concern that uh, overworked pathologists were, were making unfortunate mistakes, which led to some problems. <coughs> are there tools we can build that can help? that could help with the diagnosis to determine the expression of those. So the microarray, the breath, the biopsy, the microarray, which has 33,000 probes or genes and other things in the cell. And now we get an expression profile for a patient, and now both the classifier. How do we do this? Well, you know the rule. We're going to start with. We have 33,000 dimensional data. 3,000 different values, 160 patients. I know learning on can try to cope with this. This problem is very complicated because machine learning knows a lot about, you know, lots of examples and a small number of features. But this figures the other way around. <coughs> it's small number of instances by a huge number of features. One of the tricks to make this work, he uh, has a name, it's called the large P small n problem. You can guess why. <coughs> so we tried a whole bunch of tools with bi clustering and with graphical models and sparse BCA and with, <coughs> with you know, gene sets and pathways and so forth. 
And long story short, we actually figured out how to solve it. <coughs> Came up with, uh, uh, with good results that have very small error rates for ER. We also do PR in here too, but it's published with ER. Um, <coughs> got a paper that was again, 11 years ago. Press on that. So, <coughs> so that was with that. How am I doing for talking? So, I, I keep going. I got breast cancer, brain. Who cares about breast cancer SNPs? Who cares about brain tumor MRIs? Psychiatric disorders? Psychiatric disorders would be good. <coughs> um, let's go there, shall we? <coughs> so, the statement of fact that many psychiatric disorders look, or look, the, look the same at the first, at the first presentation. There's very different treatments. There's a canonical example of this. <coughs> um, no, I didn't say. <coughs> people, with, people who come in depressed, that might be in medical depressive disorder, or they might be bipolar. Do you give mood elevator for MDD, or mood stabilizers? for the bipolar patients. Well, at first presentation, you don't know, because you haven't seen a, a polymatic episode. And it's also very both so it's different treatments, different disorders, also within a population with the same disorder, but it works well for some and it work for others. Again, it's known that uh, for, um, again, for, psych, for MDD, a treatment works about one time in three, one time in two, depending on different treatments. They don't work that often. Can we help patients out? <laughs> so one suggestion is, Let's look at the brain and fMRI, functional magnetic resonant imaging, to distinguish disorders and use that. So right now it's going to be diagnosis, but the long-term goal will be for treatment decisions. Okay. Okay, so lots of different things here. So one example was this: um, the ADH200 competition. Do you guys know about machine competitions? Things like Kaggle. So, so it's like there's Kaggle and several other organizations that say, you want a problem? Here's a problem. Here's a real world problem. <coughs> Play with it. If you win, you get your name in the news, you get money. So Netflix prize was a million dollar prize. If you could guess who would like what movies later on, <coughs> this was just fame. But <coughs> they gave us uh, 776 subjects from seven medical centers. Some had ADHD, some did not. <coughs> we also had the residency at FMRI. You put a patient in a magnet, you move the brain, and tell the patient, don't fall asleep. You can take him out, him or her out. <coughs> so there's 190,000 voxels, you know, and every voxel had this, this image. You know, the times get 370 points. So that was, okay, so you do the math, and you get like 7 million different values per given single patient. <coughs> we also get a few other things like age and gender, handiness, and so forth about the patient, as well as the <coughs> And then, in addition to the patients we trained on, there was a whole dump set. <coughs> to predict how well, trying to make predictions on these individuals. <coughs> so, into the competition, there were 21 competitors worldwide, and we actually won. <coughs> and the best mark, <coughs> but that we pissed them off because we ignored the imaging data. It turns out, from the hospital and IQ, we should get a better score. Which really annoyed us, so they disqualified us, but <coughs> that's okay. <coughs> Lots of issues about why. Resting to fMRI is a problem here and so forth. Um, I won't talk about the details here. <coughs> Just say that we did get papers out of it, and we found clever ways we actually got better answers using the fMRI signal as well. <coughs> yeah, yeah. <coughs> another challenge, another approach was to get something called functional connectivity. So we've got. Sure, should be animation, right? So take that point there. <coughs> this is signal over time. Describe that patient. That individual for this patient. And now there's another signal. If you look at it, you see it's highly correlated. Look at correlation patterns between these two voxels. <coughs> 0.84 correlation. <coughs> what about this one? In the same test, and it's a big mess, right? It's only 0 0.06 correlated. You can look at certain regions of the brain and look at the correlation patterns between these pairs. And use that as the input, not about individual voxels, but how correlated it is over time. You get numbers. Instead of a time series, I just get my numbers from each part of this graph. <coughs> look at the super voxels, like uh, read the parcellations and push it down. <coughs> but if you just, anyway, it turns out we did pretty well on this one, because I 73% accuracy on this one. Um, and I'll skip this. That's why I can't 
Um, <coughs> got any news? Oh, let me skip this up. So there's yet other trick we use to, um, it's, you're a neurologist, right? So you know about parcellation of the brain? So, no, we mean first year, so. Oh, okay. <laughs> <coughs> the brain has many different subregions that do different things. It's a, different ways to say this region, that region. Which one's best? I don't know. <coughs> Let's try them all. Try different parcellations, and also <coughs> different types of features, like uh, correlation patterns as well as uh, bold intensity directly. And so <coughs> is that to, to treat schizophrenia, to try to diagnose never treated schizophrenic patients, patients with schizophrenia, and <coughs> did we well by its combination? Um, Boring. Okay, so also for anatomia, you heard about COVID? No? I've heard about it. You've heard about it. <coughs> work on that. So we're trying to do forecasting. So how many cases in Edmonton two weeks from now? Okay, so that's a question. <coughs> but in general, you can ask how many cases or how many deaths or how many ICU beds will be needed in some region, Edmonton or Calgary or Alberta or Canada or the USA. Should go faster <coughs> at a time in the future. <coughs> and that, that will depend on other facts in the past, those policies, basic information about demo, uh, demographics in you know, different adjacent cities, number of previous cases over time, <coughs> policies, and so forth. <coughs> so, what's our actual task? So, imagine I just I look at the number of weekly deaths, COVID in the US, <coughs> and here's some real data up until. I think it's June 27, and now the question is, can we predict five weeks from now? So I want to predict from June 27 to August 1st, you know, that week. <coughs> so that was, so we predicted that, and it turns out, <laughs> by the way, it's going to do really well. <laughs> so now we go forward one, one, one week, so July 4th, and <coughs> we can predict we're not quite so good there. <coughs> and we keep going. Okay, so we fill out, you know, we're trying to make predictions over time. And so that was our tool. Uh, that we tried to make predictions. <coughs> going. And how well did it work? Oh, and this is based not just on the number of deaths, but also the number of cases. Was well, a holiday or not? It's a big difference. How the policies are we closing the schools or, <coughs> or opening or opening the <coughs> our math the math requirements and so forth. We have mobility data about how many people from Riverbend are go to the university area every day. So all sorts of data makes predictions. <coughs> They got some good results. <coughs> um, this is a worldwide competition. There was like 60 teams that entered. Only about 20 actually looked at long range, like five to 10 week forecasts. And <coughs> they were the best. <coughs> this one's a little bit funny because this was actually an amalgamation of other ones. And they might have, um, did a way that wasn't quite fair. So we did really well in that competition. Got some papers out of that. QR code, go to that paper that was in science. Reports. <coughs> Other work we tried to try to. This is. Do you guys know about the SIR model? Uh, susceptible infected. <coughs> standard by a standard tool in the <coughs> in the uh, epidemiologic community. They look at different uh, compartments. So we look at machine learning inside SIR. So we have a very clever about learning. <coughs> some papers are forecasting. This paper just got a prize for the best paper last year. So, <coughs> in other words, predicting how many, how many hospital resources we required in different in Canada in general, and as well as, as well as individual provinces in the next four weeks. That I think would be very helpful if I knew this hospital would be overrun. I could take the patients there and move to other locations now. So we try to get good results there. Let's get diabetes. Let me just. <coughs> jump to one, one technical topic, which is survival prediction. <coughs> you guys know what a capillary plot is? So this is, <coughs> this is for a patient with stage four stomach cancer. <coughs> we look at how many deaths occur at, at each time. So, so for example, <coughs> this says that after 10 months, half of the people with stage four stomach cancer have died. So <coughs> this is for a population. So it's actually 11 months. That's the mean survival time. This is for a population, which is great if you care about the population. If it's your mother, you, know, you want to know whether she's there or there. You can make individual predictions. <coughs> okay. so, so just show there's a variety. 
Here, two of the patients we had, so these are two patients, both with stage four stomach cancer. <coughs> and we also have like 30 other features, including various blood factors. <coughs> so this is Mr. Uh, 1314, and this is our, our individual curve for this, indi for this person, and we predict he's going to live 21 months, twice as long as we actually look correct on that. <coughs> so that was one patient. Another patient, unfortunately, in this 1523, um, she actually died in a fifth of the time that we estimated. Uh, that the Kelp Meyer curve is, we have a more accurate estimate because this, for her, it's all the features of this stage for stomach cancer. <coughs> the tools for doing that. This is a tool we built for people with a liver transplant. And, and then, <coughs> Phil, Phil Howard and, no, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I keep saying it. This is for, <coughs> uh, Aldo and um, Norm Knittelman. Yeah. <coughs> so, <coughs> description of a patient, and we're trying to we're trying to figure out which patient should be waitlisted for a particular particular graph. We can build curves. So, for this patient, <coughs> look at this is the Kaplan Meyer curve for the whole population. This patient is actually uh, one year survival, ninety seven percent, and I'm sorry, five year survival. Uh, 90% and so forth. This person probably should be waitlisted. This person probably should not because limited resources probably makes sense given to a patient who could live longest with it. So we call this tool that's deployed. <coughs> that was published six years ago. <coughs> Another question is not time to death, but time to onset. So here's an example we have. Um, how long until a woman will develop breast cancer? In many cases, she never will, which is great. Or she never will to die of other causes when she gets 105 years old, but they just die of breast cancer. We built a tool which, which says that this is what you are right now. If you know, like we think you think you're gonna you're now 35 years old, we think the median time will be about 47, you know, this interval, like 47 years before you develop breast cancer. But <coughs> these are factors you could change if you were to. Uh, get more exercise and eat less proteins. Instead of being 44, we think we can delay breast cancer for another, to give you 18 more years of breast cancer free time. So our goal would be to have, imagine in a mammography clinic, <coughs> on, on an iPad there, and while she's waiting for a breast, for a mammography, she can fill this form <coughs> and then get information that we set to her cell phone or set to her doctor if she chooses to. And so this way right now, if you change this or change that, this way things would happen. Lots of issues here about counterfactuals and so forth, but this is just a preliminary investigation. <coughs> okay. okay, skip, skip, skip. <coughs> Another cute thing about uh, predicting kidney, uh, topic monitor for kidney cancer. I'll skip, skip, skip. There's other examples of predicting survival time for people with cancer based on genomic information. <coughs> uh, survival version of COVID 19 patients, time until they were discharged, either they get really better and they leave a hospital to are healthy or they get sicker and die. We predict these two different outcomes. <coughs> okay. Let me wrap up. Um, statistical issues, let me skip that. Let me just, um, <coughs> let me skip this. Let's go on. Just, just point out that uh, <coughs> there are questions like, okay, I gave a bunch of examples. What, when should you try learning? Oh. <coughs> um, this is supervised machine learning. You have a well-defined performance task. You want to know what you're trying to do. You already have, you already have the answer. You want to know how to do what is arithmetic, what is 5 plus 7. I know this well. Don't use machine learning. If you know the answer already, don't talk to me. I don't know. You have to solve it. If you know the answer and you got data, then we can talk. <coughs> Training data is useful to have. <coughs> Collaborators, if you send an email at 2 in the morning at 2.30, they come back with the answer because they also care about this problem. <coughs> Another issue about um, can you build a predictor for x given y? Sure, about accuracy or simplicity. And they say, well, of course I want accuracy. Patients, patients' lives depend on it. She was said, I said, I did it. You know, so it's a support vector machine with a you know, basis function, which is why not? It's 82%, we're done. <coughs> doctor said, no, 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 wait a second, wait a second. Which feature do you use? Uh, how does it work? If I don't understand, I can't use it. I mean, she just said accuracy is important, but more than understandability, but if I can't, I can't understand it, how can I possibly use it? That issue of explainability comes up again and again. I've got strong opinions about that. 
I, I don't think that's what machine learning is. It's not what machine learning does. Just gives an answer. You guys know about counterfactuals, interventions, and that thing? The whole body of issues about why I set up an intervention, why that might not work. Um, just finding correlations isn't enough. So did you know that um, um, that umbrellas cause car accidents. You knew that, right? Because people with umbrellas in a car are often in accidents, so it must be causal, right? You know that's wrong. Why? Well, the umbrella in the car is evidence of rain, and that's what led to the accident. So the fact that I can see correlations, you know, back to the example I used earlier about <coughs> telling a woman that if you got more exercise, that will reduce intervention. That means you're going to be healthier. Well, <coughs> maybe if you get more exercise, you know, eat more of the wrong foods and that will cause other problems. Or maybe the fact that <coughs> you get breast cancer, the fact you don't exercise is not because, maybe there's one factor that caused you not to exercise, it's also to break cancer. And so if you exercise more, that's evidence that <coughs> this factor, this genetic code, this thing in your brain was turned different way. And so exercise won't make a difference. These interventions are complicated things. I recommend this book uh, <coughs> by Yudhaya Pearl that talks about these different issues. <coughs> explanation and even features that don't do things. Let me wrap up <coughs> on the part of Amy that does a lot of cool stuff, you know, Bird Machine Intelligence Institute. You know, lots of people. We started with four people <coughs> in 2002, and now we're about 30 people with federal funding, both provincial funding. <coughs> there are lots of questions, including machine for health, and we are also engaged with collaborations. I do a lot, I do too much, but it's so much fun doing it. <coughs> um, I want to acknowledge my wonderful students as well as medical collaborators because again I don't you know, I, I don't get into medical stuff but, but these guys do and they think I do quite effectively over the, the decades now as well as my funders. <coughs> Summary slide, association studies are really nice. They tell you what's correlated with what and to, uh, to knock out to have you. <coughs> but they're not designed to predict patient okay. not their goal. <coughs> That's what you want to do. You want to predict your study. To do that, the patient-specific treatments, your diagnosis, you need to do something to predict your studies. And that machine learning provides the tools for that. And it's critical for applications in bioinformatics, microinformatics. Here, I've got a recording of this one if you want. I've got two other recordings. I guess I'm going to get this one in two weeks from now, I think. And that's understood. All of which is available. I'll stop here. Yeah, so we have a midterm on March 21st, and it's um, open book, and they they can access the internet and so on. So, and they can spend basically as long as they want. I mean, they can spend up to four hours on a one-hour exam. So, if you can think of questions related to your two lectures that you think would be a useful part of that. Uh, we've been using the same AI questions for, for a long time. We need to change them up a little bit. Yeah. Since, you know, AI is now fairly rigorous science. For many years it wasn't. And the standard joke was every year the AI quiz is the same, but every year the answers are different. <laughs> So, is there my lecture? Questions? Answers? Hi, so one. Uh, yeah. You talked about lawyers uh, in that set. So, um, if they are particularly relevant, for example, patients that are one out of 10,000 cases, yeah. can we keep? more importance to that in order to come for <coughs> them in the past, for example, weights or? Well, um, yes, you certainly could. Um, a caveat is, what if I get, what if the, the way to make that one right means 30 get wrong? Mm -hmm. You get, <coughs> don't want that either, <coughs> but you don't know what the right answer is initially. So there are ways you can try to overweight it, but, but what you think about is, you, know, you want to works for everyone all the time. <coughs> How can you argue against that? But that's not really what it is. <coughs> Stochastic effects, that means it might not work every place. 
There's also secondary influences. That means that um, the way to make this case work means you have to make other assumptions about the world which leads to mistakes there. So <coughs> there's a tool. I, I very quickly mentioned this idea. <coughs> the word um, stacking. stacking. Boosting. <coughs> the way boosting works is you build one learning algorithm, one learning algorithm to a data set, <coughs> and you produce uh, some answers that want a validation set, you see which one you got wrong. You then emphasize when you got wrong, build a second classifier that, that weights that. And again, he's now enough weight, you probably get him right. But the third one, but now you make other mistakes. <coughs> and now you, you find these guys are wrong, you, you upweight those. And there are tools boosting that does better. That doesn't solve the problem either. You still make mistakes. The question is, where do you make the mistakes? <coughs> and a lot of clever people try lots of things. I want to be perfect. I want my audio to be perfect. That's something we'll do, unfortunately. We've got medical doctors here. Have you ever, I mean, there's mistakes. There's times when you make the wrong diagnosis or treatment. Let's ignore those. The times you take the right treatment, the right decisions, with negative consequences. Good decision, bad outcome happens. So, sorry to burst your bubble, but it's not perfect. It probably never will be. Other questions? So for like, if you would want to predict certain outcomes for um, like breast cancer or yeah. other disorders, um, you would need to have like pre-existing like data from other patients. But isn't there like, is it like patient data? Like, isn't it confidential? <coughs> so like, how would you get all that data if it's confidential? Yeah. So answers. One answer is often patients. I've had surgery and I said, where do I sign? Make my data public. And many patients feel the same way. Um, so we do get that type of data. There's also this anonymization technology which tries to make it as anonymous as possible. Is it really, <coughs> if you really, really are going to protect it, the way to protect your data is to tear it up and drop it bottom of the ocean. But I know I'm going to get sure of it. The ways to try to make it more anonymous make it more difficult to find this idea of um, <coughs> differential privacy. That, uh, is, is Nidhi Hector going to give a talk in this series? What? Uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Nidhi Hector, <coughs> there's technologies for trying to make the data harder to detect. So the idea is, I've got a data set here um, which has a patient in it. Let me make a change to the data set such that let me have a modification of the learning algorithm such that you can't tell the patient whether or not with 99% confidence. There's ways to try to do that. So there's lots of techniques which I've used. There's also techniques <coughs> for, uh, I want to build a learning algorithm. So something called federated learning. There's Hospital Edmonton and Hospital Calgary and they hate each other. Well, they won't talk to each other. <coughs> I want to build a model. Ed Edmonton can look at Edmonton data and do a good job there. The Calgary, the Calgary did a good job there, but the more data you get, the better answers. So there's ways I can have better data. I can have <coughs> Edmonton or some intermediate can say, I want to look at, I want to get this cumulative, not the data, but the, the patterns in the data. And now I can do queries to Edmonton and queries to Calgary, and I get a tool which is better and better for both systems without ever exposing the detail of Calgary and or Edmonton the data. So patient privacy is a real issue. Mm -hmm. uh, every 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 paper I refer to here, at some point, now there's <coughs> papers I've done which are pretty theoretical work that's some of those. Once I've got patient data, there's ethics committee, and I have participated on filled out forms and here's the program I follow. Here's here's why the patient's confidentiality is being preserved as best as best we can. Here's a disclosure that they filled out. <coughs> One mentioned never mentioned your founders a moment ago. Maybe, maybe you know, a thousand patients, <coughs> maybe only 500 of them fill out the form. I don't know a lot about those patients. Maybe the people who don't fill out the form have a brain part that they're very suspicious, and it means they also get cancer. So I'm getting a skewed population. Well, but the good news is people filled out the form, I'll do well in those patients. But they will see their data, and so I won't do well in that. <coughs> Again, I would like to probe everyone. I'm not, I'm not doing it to me. It's just showing what I want, statistics, what I want, says I want to treat a certain type of patient, I want to deal with a certain environment, a certain distribution. 
I just have to have samples that's in the distribution. If they withhold it, it's not my fault. I can tell you that. <coughs> but good question. Ed. Have you had talks about patient confidentiality in this series? Yes. It's an important topic. <coughs> but there is always this, this competition, this uh, <coughs> tension. That I'd be nice if I get all the data. There are some countries that make the data more easily available. And the <coughs> downside is that you reveal these people who want revealed. The upside is, well, you've got the whole population. And so, again, I, I'm not a politician. I don't want to, I won't ever force them to give me their data. But I will point out to your advantage and the people who look like you, you know, the population of people, the more I know about this, about who you are, the better have people who are similar to you. <coughs> again, historically, you know, there's been <coughs> many studies of men that say women are just like men, right? And they're not. And they say, well, let's just assume they are. And it doesn't work. And now there's many organizations that say, we need more data about women. Full stop. It's not, it's not because we're being mean or mean. It's just the fact we need the data. Other questions? <coughs> OK, great. We look forward to your second lecture. OK. <coughs> Bye -bye.